I'll just make a few uh, points here uh, along the lines of where we are going. Uh, there is this hypothetical uh, theoretical line called the Movius line proposed by Movius which basically said uh, that the density of the population determined uh, the expertise, the survival and so on and that the migration here uh, showed the hypothetical routes out of Africa highlighting a southern coastal route along the Indian Ocean coastline that may have been taken by humans migrating out of Africa. So this is uh, considered a line beyond which the density was so low that uh, uh, they couldn't survive and breed enough or whatever. So you can see that uh, we have seen several such uh, routes already but just keep this Movius line by archaeologist Movius and we have already talked about the timing and the sea level changes that would have to be involved for crossing these potentially because it isn't clear whether they had the boat technologies, seafaring technologies to cross large water bodies. Uh, there are thousands of islands here now uh, in the Indonesian Sea's maritime continent, but during uh, some of the past uh, uh, cold times, uh, sea level would have dropped and there would have been many land bridges as we saw with the last glacial maximum, for example. Uh, this also raises the question about uh, Europe, why the uh, earliest evidence of uh, uh, the Homo lineage appears only about 780,000 years ago compared to elsewhere uh, and the uh, earliest evidence comes around a million years ago or a little bit older uh, from the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, so this Movius line here uh, basically oops I forgot to put the, the reference here uh, but it's a paper that you can find by just googling Movius line. So it talks about the technology differences south of or on this side of the uh, Movius line, southwest of the Movius line uh, with Motu Achiulian whereas here we had Mold 1, Odo, Mold 1, Old 1. So these are more sophisticated than these and the idea is that population density and exchanges made uh, this possible here and the survival was affected by that. Uh, in terms of Europe the ideas are still kind of not well established in terms of why uh, the arrival was delayed and uh, whether there was uh, cannibalism involved uh, where the early uh, homo lineages, modern behavioral homo lineages that arrived got uh, eaten up by the ones that were there before like the Neanderthals uh, and if you look at the evidences in Africa uh, using the various tools and the increase in productivity of the tools, production of the tools, it's been argued that even though they were distributed uh, seemingly far away there must have been some social connectivity so it's, it isn't clear whether population density is necessary to have uh, expertise and shared knowledge and uh, improvements in tools and higher production and so on. Uh, this argues that even though there were distant uh, settlements there was somehow communication uh, between them. So you have to go through the arguments made by this paper uh, to look at what the logic is in claiming this but I just wanted to include it to say that these issues are not so simple. But the earliest settlements found in the Iberian Peninsula were along the lakes where uh, many faunal and floral signature uh, evidences are found. So the faunal material from Fuenta Nueva 3 in southern Spain uh, had all these species there. The southern mammoth hippopotamus, rhinoceros, horse, giant deer, deer, bovines, uh, caprines, saber-toothed tiger, bear, porcupine, voles and uh, an extinct vole. In terms of faunal materials from Branco Leon, also in the Iberian Peninsula of southern Spain, uh, they had rodents, broad-toothed field mouse, wood mouse, 
Dormouse, extinct mole, vole, rabbit, saber-toothed cat, horse, giant deer, cervids, bovine goat, uh, ovibovine sheep, hippopotamus, southern mammoth, bovines, and so on. So there was, uh, it isn't clear whether the survival and arrival of the earliest uh, homo lineages in this area had something to do with the faunal and floral assemblages there and whether the arrival of the uh, homo lineages then affected these uh, assemblages as well. But in general, uh, ecology has to be considered together with uh, climate and uh, homo diaspora. This paper looks at temporal trends in functional trait composition of Eastern African large herbivore communities over the last seven million years and argues that the early uh, evolution happened in no analog situations as far as ecological assemblages were concerned. I'm just putting it in there to say that these uh, debates go on and they are not very clearly resolved. Purple shading here represents modern range variation for each trait, while diamonds indicate fossil communities that fall within the modern range of variation for all eight functional traits which cover non-ruminants, grazers, mixed feeders and browsers. So grazers are the ones that eat grass and lower vegetation which is high in silica, needs uh, strong teeth to uh, 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 chew them and digest them. Uh, and browsers eat leaves and fruits and flowers uh, so they are uh, in the uh, eating in the upper uh, level uh, less uh, hard material than these. So here are the number of uh, species uh, as residuals. Uh, you can look up the details in this paper, but I'm just trying to make a point that if you look at the timing of the evolution of the hominin species, the gray here, so let's first finish. Orange circles indicate fossil communities that are non-analog. That means they were not there in uh, they are not there in the modern range uh, at all. Uh, they fall outside the modern range of variation for one or more of the functional traits illustrated here. Dark gray lines represent less regression with a smoothing factor of 0.75. Less is basically a fine dust that is an indication of how rainy it was because the less gets carried far away. Uh, when it's dry and there are less mountains in China, for example, which correspond to monsoonal variations. So complicated looking figure, but basically the point is that uh, climate and uh, vegetation and uh, grazers and browsers at that time uh, were uh, not anything that's present today. So outside of the modern range of uh, non-ruminants, grazers, mixed feeders, and browsers during the hominin revolution, uh, uh, evolution. Okay. Uh, also, along the way, uh, we have we'll come back to this later on uh, in another chapter. Uh, if we look at the ITCZ intertropical conversion zone in modern climate now, uh, when the sun is to the south in the boreal. Uh, winter months or austral summer months, uh, ITCZ is mostly to the south except in few places where it gets pushed to the north. There are details of why this happens which I won't go into. But in the boreal summer you can see that the monsoonal circulation pulls it way to the north here and that would have affected the evolution of the monsoon is related to possibly the evolution of uh, the Himalayas, a uh, crashing of the Indian subcontinent into the Asian landmass, uh, which started about 30 million years ago and the current monsoon got established, let's say, around 10 million years ago. Uh, along with that, there was evolution of uh, different uh, photosynthetic pathways like C3 and C4 grasses uh, which depend on the atmospheric CO2 level and daytime growing uh, season temperature. So uh, the evolution of the monsoon uh, affected the vegetation types and it also affected the uh, 
non-ruminants, grazers, mixed breeders, and browsers, and so on. So all these are interrelated, and then the question is whether out of Africa and the migration routes and so on are also related to that. So it's a question of whether increased sea levels were favorable for settlements and survival, lowered sea levels were favorable, more rain, resource limitations. So lots of mixed signals exist. Uh, so we have we cannot always uh, bring together the evidence to make robust conclusions, but uh, lots of pieces of evidence exist, and then you try to do the best you can to put together a narrative that combines climate change at the time, um, the tools, the behavioral uh, uh, level of the species you are looking at, uh, the brain size and so on and so forth. So obviously uh, it's a kind of a, a story that's put together and you have to uh, read a lot to see if you can actually draw any conclusions. But one thing is clear, since the topic of the course is climate and human evolution, that uh, climate has been an integral part, not uh, only directly affecting resources, uh, but also in terms of affecting uh, availability of uh, flora and fauna at the time. Maybe that's related to resources, so we have to be careful what we mean by resources. So we'll come back to a little bit more details before we close this chapter in terms of uh, what happened in the Americas in terms of uh, popul populating the Americas, which I mentioned in the beginning of the uh, chapter. Uh, we'll revisit it and look at the summary of uh, hominin diaspora out of Africa to see what it is that we have said so far. We have said many things and uh, I have actually tried to summarize it. The, the chapter in the book is really, really long with hundreds of references so you can read more carefully if you want. But I'm going to uh, get past this into the climate part uh, after the next podcast uh, to end this chapter, okay?